The first team to launch their 1995 Championship Challenger is Jordan. Team principal Eddie Jordan wanting to make the most of pre-season testing time and to begin to forge a working relationship with new engine supplier Peugeot. The French engine manufacturer will be hoping for better things from their new 3-litre V10 and not a repeat performance of last year. 1995 sees another new team in Formula 1, 40. Drivers are Brazilian new boy Pedro Diniz and the experienced Roberto Moreno. World champion Michael Schumacher is joined at Benetton by Johnny Herbert in the new B195, now with Renault V10 engines. Jordan on track at Silverstone, braving the cold, wet January weather, with rock star Chris Rear lending moral support to Irvine, who is anxious to get his first impressions in fast-fading light. Very cold, wet tyres, wet track, new regulations, there's, there's no grip basically. Um, but the balance is good, which is, is nice, um, but we're going to have to wait to see what that's like down in um, Jerez, but I'm pretty confident it's going to be good. And now, finally to reveal perhaps the worst kept secret in the sport, joining the team for the new season is the man who is far and away the most successful driver currently in Formula One. Please welcome the 1992 world champion, Nigel Mansell. Nigel is joined by Mika Hakkinen and 94 British Formula 3 champion Jan Magnussen, the team test driver, as the McLaren F1 road car substitutes for the yet-to-be-launched MP410. Ferrari launches are always big news, and the attendant press are kept on their toes through countless speeches before the car is finally unveiled. Ferrari president Luca de Montezemolo, team principal Jean Todt, and designer John Barnard. What you see before you um, when the cover comes off is uh, in fact not the whole story um, there will be more pieces that will go on before the car runs and um, this is a deliberate um, attempt perhaps to um, restrict other people's wind tunnel times in investigating anything that we might have that's new and uh, probably the same goes for other cars that they haven't actually shown us everything yet and finally, it's the engine man's turn before the drivers pull back the covers in front of the world's press. Ferrari private test facility, Fiorano. The new 412T2 runs for the first time in front of the spy lenses of the assembled photographers. And Gerhard Berger does his best not to disappoint. The Austrian's first impressions are positive but qualified. Seems to be alright. Doesn't, doesn't have any problems at the moment. Very difficult to see because it's different uh, aerodynamic than the other car is sliding and these things, but uh, I don't see anything wrong on it. Damon Hill is in relaxed mood at Jerez, as are the Williams team in general. The reason? More wet weather. The Williams does get some running in, however, in an interim spec car. It winds up the week comfortably quickest, ahead of fellow Renault V10 team Benetton with their new car, taking the opportunity to check that the new champion hasn't grown since last season. It's wet at Silverstone too, as the new Tyrrell Yamaha is put through its paces by Katayama. 
Back in London, the warm, dry confines of the Science Museum play host to another McLaren extravaganza. This time, the launch of the new MP410. McLaren Mercedes MP410. The car with which Nigel Mansell and Mika Hakkinen will contest the 1995 Formula One World Championship. Radical progression, this, for McLaren, shaped by the new rules for the new season. Well, I mean, uh, I think everybody will agree when they come and see it, uh, especially from the side, it's even more impressive than the front. And uh, I think we can agree that if it uh, goes as quick as it looks, uh, I think everybody must watch out. McLaren's interpretation of the new rules is certainly very different to that of the other teams. After several troubled years, the Norfolk base of Team Lotus, probably the most innovative of rule interpreters, finally closes its doors. The 1960 Lotus 18 had introduced fully adjustable suspension. Then came the first monocoque in 62, ground effect in 77, and active suspension in 81. Colin Chapman was responsible for them all, and took seven constructors' championships before his premature demise in 1982. Thanks to the remarkable efforts of Ayrton Senna, a handful of victories would follow from 85 to 87. But championship success would always elude Peter Waugh, who had taken over from Chapman. From 1991 to the end of 94, lack of finance for paid to any more victories, and despite every effort, Peter Collins finally had to give up his dream of re-establishing Team Lotus. The last Chapman victory came at the Austrian Grand Prix in 1982, the late Elio De Angelis taking the flag for Lotus's 73rd win. Only six more would ever follow. The show must go on, however, and deep in the heart of London's theatre land, the Lotus name has found a new partner in the Pacific team. The launch of the new PR02 providing the opportunity for an explanation. Recently, we have forged an alliance with Team Lotus, which I hope will keep the spirit alive in Formula One for the name, and between us we hope to enhance the commercial images and develop new opportunities for both the companies. Pacific are somewhat out of practice when it comes to opening the champagne, but at Didcot not only are they well versed in the art, with the launch of the new car, expectations are high for 1995. I really am fully prepared for this year. I've, uh, I've spent a long time preparing myself, and I know that the Williams team have spent an awful long time preparing this car. The FW17 is the product of many, many hours' work in the wind tunnel by Adrian Newey and uh, with the, the uh, technical directorship of uh, Patrick Head and all the people at Williams. They put in such a lot of effort into this car. It's going to be a, a race winner, and I fully expect to be a championship winner as well. You know, Adrian and the 
team have used some very interesting uh, ideas to get around the, or, or to adapt to the new regulations. And um, if it goes as quickly as it looks, then we'll have a race winner. With both teams keen to get out on the circuit for initial shakedown runs, prior to commencing a full test program at Estoril, we can take a look at the major changes for 1995. Last year's three and a half litre engines have been reduced to three in an effort to cut power output. But the most visual changes are the look of the cars for 1995. Side pods have been increased in height to improve lateral protection for the drivers. Depth of the front wings and the front wing end plates have been reduced significantly. The overall height of the car is lower for 1995 too. And the rear wing assembly has been lowered substantially to reduce the amount of downforce available. Careful inspection of the underneath reveals a more significant step in the underside of the car. That is, in addition to the plank, which made its debut last year. From the side, we get a chance to see the improvements to the driver's cockpit safety. An increase in the amount of deformable structure at the front of the monocoque. Higher sides to the cockpit, as well as an overall elongation of the cockpit aperture, will improve both safety and driver comfort, particularly beneficial to taller drivers. For 1995, the teams are required to pass a stringent new set of crash and deformation tests. Not only are the monocoque subjected to a number of external loads, measurements are also taken to determine the effect on the inside of the cockpit, and the teams have to pass the criteria set by the FIA on all the tests. Previously, crash testing has been limited to frontal impact protection, but for 1995, the side impact test is mandatory. Here at the Motor Industry Research Association, a McLaren MP410 easily passes the test. As for the drivers, Mika Salo lands a Tyrrell seat for 95 with just two Grand Prix experience. His first in a Lotus at Suzuka last year came by chance and he was thrown in at the deep end. I think it was six days before the race and said, do you think you, you can drive it next weekend with no testing and uh, just go there. I never sat in a Formula One car in my life, but that, that's always what I wanted. So I said, yes, I know the circuit. I don't think it's the problem. I go. And that was it. Then I next two nights I just lay on my bed on my back and was smiling and I was so happy that it was happening. So. Jos Verstappen is released from Benetton testing duties to join Nick Wirth's Simtech team. Roberto Moreno's last Grand Prix was in Spa 1992. Brazil 95 sees the jocular Brazilian second only to Nigel Mansell in the age league. Taki Inui is new to Formula One. He joins Gianni Morbidelli at Arrows this year with Hart V8 power. Domenico Schiattarella gets the second Simtech seat after making his debut with the team at Jerez last year. Big news at McLaren is that Blundell replaces Mansell for the first two races. Nigel doesn't fit in the car. Whilst Nigel could fit in the car, it was quite clear that he couldn't drive the car when he was sat in it. Um, even in the workshop, we were both he and the team were quite optimistic that whilst being snug, it wouldn't hamper his ability to drive the car, but uh, that proved definitely not to be the case in Mr. Will. He was really quite badly bruised after the first day, and um, to his credit, continued to uh, work with us in order to highlight some of the development problems that we had on the car. No one will forget the incident that decided the 1994 championship. Whatever your standpoint, a lot of questions remain unanswered. It was a very hard all the way. It was a, it was a terrific on. race. And uh, all I can say is that uh, it's over now and uh, it's, it's a bit of a, an empty feeling, but I think I gave him a good run for his money. And uh, he certainly was feeling the pressure because uh, he ended up falling off the road. Can the champion sustain pressure? Is Hill capable of overtaking him on the track? Schumacher was definitely under pressure during qualifying for Brazil. A light off damaging the front of the Benetton, followed by a major shunt from which the German was lucky to escape unhurt. 
nevertheless, he's still managed to qualify on the front row alongside Damon Hill, three tenths slower than the Englishman. With Coulthard third, Herbert fourth, and Berger and Alesi fifth and sixth, the Brazilian crowd would have to look back to 16th spot to find new hero Rubens Barrichello in the Jordan Berger. At the first corner, it's Schumacher who sneaks past Hill from Coulthard. A flying Hakkinen, Berger, Herbert and Alesi as Harness Ligier is an early casualty. The Frenchman's car spinning on the exit of the first corner and hitting the inner wall. On the run down the sixth gear back straight, Hill climbs all over the back of Schumacher's Benetton. And already a small gap is developing back to Coulthard in third. The champion is right on the limit in his attempt to hold on to the lead, locking up his brakes into the second gear, Vico Du Pato. At the end of lap one, the order is Schumacher, Hill, Coulthard, Hacken and Berger, Alessi and Herbert. With Schumacher obviously holding Hill up, the chasing pack edges closer and Alessi finds himself being held up by teammate Berger. On lap three, Hill took a stab at resting the lead, only for Schumacher to give him the chop, force him to back off, and Coulthard nearly finding a way past. Lap 11, and Frenson's electrics expired. He'd been 12. At the front, Schumacher was under intense pressure from Hill once more. Lap 16, ninth place Katayama had spun and stalled, the Japanese suffering from huge understeer in the T-car. Eddie Irvine's Jordan Peugeot made the first pit stop of 1995, but never rejoined. Gearbox failure would be the first cause of Jordan retirement in the new season. Of the front runners, Jean Alesi was first to stop, rejoining back down in 11th spot. With the leading duo still locked in combat at the front, the Benetton team were the first to prepare for a stop. Michael Schumacher peeling off into the pit lane on lap 18. Williams were ready too, but for Schumacher things weren't good. He rejoined behind Berger's Ferrari and the Austrian wouldn't be easy to pass. At the end of lap 21, Hill came in for his first stop. It was longer than Schumacher's, but with the German having lost time behind Berger's Ferrari, Hill would keep the lead. Schumacher had only been delayed one lap by Berger, passing the Austrian at the end of the start-finish straight. and was in on lap 23 from second position to the delight of Ron Dennis the troublesome MP410 going much better than expected with Hill leading and Schumacher second the Williams was able to steadily pull out two or three tenths per lap Berger pitted at the end of lap 27 whilst lying fourth, Gerhard having to endure the frustrations of a stubborn front wheel nut. It was enough to drop him back down the order. <laughs> having dropped to seventh after his pit stop, Hakkinen was elevated by Berger's misfortune to sixth and almost immediately disposed of the other Ferrari to move into fifth on lap 28. At the front, Hill was enjoying a comfortable cushion over Schumacher until on lap 30, he lost second gear. Then at the start of lap 31, things went terribly wrong.
Frank Williams could only look on at the replay in the pit garage monitor. Thus, Schumacher inherited the coveted lead position, but Bria Torres' joy would be tempered with Herbert's demise on the same lap, Johnny being taken out by Suzuki's Ligier. The sudden decimation of the leading runners promoted Mikasano Tyrrell to third. This, remember, only his third Grand Prix and his first for Tyrrell. But compatriot Mika Hakkinen was bearing down quickly, and on lap 38, suffering from cramp and exhaustion, the pressure led to the inevitable lapse in concentration. Coulthard had taken the lead when Schumacher made his second stop, but on lap 45 it was Coulthard's turn and roles would be reversed. With Benetton on a three-stop strategy, Schumacher still needed one more stop, which duly came on lap 52. Slick teamwork by the Benetton crew ensuring that Michael could get in and out without relinquishing his lead. Coulthard was some eight seconds behind the Benetton and could do nothing to catch the champion before the chequered flag. It was therefore an easy win for Schumacher and the delighted Benetton team. Coulthard would finish second after an uneventful but solid opener to his 1995 campaign, and Gerhard Berger would cross the line third in typically dogged fashion after that earlier problem in the pits. For Damon Hill, it was 10 championship points lost, and more importantly, to his chief rival. A good win then for Michael Schumacher to open his account for the new season. And further back, new boy Pedro Diniz had something to celebrate. The Brazilian debutant bringing his 40 home in 8th place in front of his home crowd. Later that evening, Gerhard Berger would be declared the winner. Both Schumacher and Coulthard disqualified. The FIA having found their elf fuel different to the registered sample after qualifying. I was very comfortably in the lead and looking very good for the race because I'd only done one stop and only had one more to do and Michael had an extra stop to do to me so uh, things were looking very good and then I lost uh, a gear um, on the back part of the circuit second gear and then coming into the first corner here uh, accelerating down the hill and uh, the gearbox I think the gearbox seized up but I'm not absolutely sure yet what happened Echoes of Mansell in 91. Same corner, a gearbox problem eliminating him from an almost certain victory. Senna who collected the win that time, this time Schumacher. In no way I would have imagined I'm going to win this race. I was settled already for second or third position. During scrutineering, the fuel from a number of the cars was uh, analysed. Uh, two of those cars were Schumacher and Coulthard. The fuel from those cars, it was found, uh, did not... The fingerprint of that fuel did not match the library uh, analysis which we hold before the start of the season. The technical delegate of the FI made this aware to the stewards of the meeting and the stewards of the meeting found that the teams uh, Mile 7 Benetton Renault and Rothmans Williams Renault were in breach of the regulations and therefore excluded them from the results. Despite the protestations of Elf, Williams and Benetton that the fuel was legal, their only recourse would be an appeal to the FIA. Benetton's Greg Field explains. Both Williams and Benetton have appealed against the exclusion, and now we're waiting for Elf to produce the correct, the correct analysis of the fuel, and I'm confident that we both will be reinstated in the race. On the 13th of April, the FIA International Court of Appeal duly overturned the decision of the stewards in Brazil, reinstating Schumacher and Coulthard, but not their manufacturer's points. Brazil marked Gerhard Berger's 80th appearance for Ferrari. He now joins Alvareto at the top of the list of drivers who have driven the most Grand Prix for the Scuderia. For the Brazilian Grand Prix only, Barrichello sported a new helmet design in deference to his late compatriot, Ayrton Senna. More than a decade on, Formula One returns to Argentina for round two of the championship and a chance for the nation's last Grand Prix star to get back behind the wheel of an F1 car. Carlos Reutemann, still capable of displaying his skills in a 1994 Ferrari 412T1. After turning in some very quick laps and obviously enjoying every minute, perhaps this little chat with two former employers might have some significance.
Argentine President Carlos Menem was an interested visitor despite the loss of son Carlos Jr. in a tragic helicopter accident. If the Formula One has returned, that gives us great credibility. When it left, it's because we didn't have any more credibility in the country. Now Argentina is back in race and we are very proud. The president presented David Coulthard with the Carlos Menem Jr. trophy in honor of his pole position, Coulthard's first in Formula One. The Scott had dominated qualifying ahead of Hill and Schumacher, with Irvine fourth, Hakkinen fifth, Alesi sixth, and Salo up in seventh. At the lights, Coulthard made a flyer of a start ahead of Hill and Schumacher, but it was nothing on Frentzen, up to fifth from ninth with Hakkinen just in front and Irvine right behind. Then, chaos. Who touched who first was not important. But Alesi, Salo, Bedoas, Minardi, Herbert, Parnis, Martini and Barrichello were all eliminated in one fell swoop. No question, red flag and the race was stopped. Only Luca Bedoa would not make the restart. The rest either in spare or repaired cars, ready for another go. Again, Coulthard was first away, this time from Schumacher, then Hill, as Hakkinen found the rear of his car savaged by the nose of Irvine's Jordan. The McLaren driver spinning into instant retirement while the Jordan headed for the pits. At the front, Coulthard was sprinting away from Schumacher at Hill, with Salo, Alessi and Frentzen a long way back from the leading trio. All eyes were now on the Hill-Schumacher battle as the champion struggled to hold one Williams at bay whilst keeping in touch with the other ahead. Then on lap six, fate played its hand. Coulthard slowed dramatically. In an instant, he was demoted to third. An electrical gearbox problem, the culprit. A lap later, an Irvine was out for good this time, the Peugeot dumping its oil. With Hill still climbing all over Schumacher's tail, Coulthard quickly eliminated the gap to third. Lap nine and Blundell's McLaren was in trouble. Running in eighth place, the Mercedes split an oil cooler and the V10 expired there and then. Lap 11, Hill dummied Schumacher into the first corner and was through into the lead. The extent to which Schumacher had been holding him up was immediately noticeable. Now Coulthard needed to find a way past the German. At the start of lap 16, Coulthard took the bull by the horns, passing Schumacher the hard way after the Benetton driver had tried to box him in behind Martinez Minardi. The same lap, Hill came in for his first fuel tire stop. Thirteen and a half seconds later, he rejoined in third. But Coulthard's race was over, not even a lap after passing Schumacher. Mechanical gremlins had struck and his impressive weekend came to a premature end. Schumacher was thus back in the lead, while Coulthard was left wondering what might have been. On lap 17, Schumacher was in for his first stop of the afternoon. Seven point four seconds was much quicker than the Williams had managed, but not enough to avoid losing the lead to a Lacey and second place to Hill. With Hill and Schumacher adopting three-stop strategies, Lacey was on a two-stopper, and it wasn't long before the Ferrari had the Williams right on its tail. When Lacey headed for the pits on lap 26, Hill took over the lead, which he would keep for the rest of the race.
Messi, though, the battle was with Schumacher for second place. And with precious seconds ticking by in the pits, the German was edging closer. Cutting it uncomfortably fine, Alessi rejoined, his second position intact, but only just. Schumacher couldn't find a way past and would stay in third. Further back, Johnny Herbert had quietly moved his way up to fourth place in the second Benetton by lap 33. Alessi was safe in second, but still pushing hard. Whilst for Damon Hill, he had lapped the entire field up to Schumacher in third before the finish. For the Williams team eagerly awaiting the chequered flag and Damon crossing the line, this would be the first win for their 1995 account. It was emphatic and it looked as if arch rivals Benetton was some way off the winning pace. It had been a good return to Argentina, and Carlos Reutemann, here with the president's daughter, must have had many thoughts during the race. David Coulthard, too, would have been on the podium, but for mechanical problems, on which tier we'll never know. But the day belonged to Damon Hill. Alessi was a competitive second, and for a change, Schumacher wasn't smiling. I'm really delighted. I've ten Grand Prix victories. It's uh, great to break into double figures, and uh, it just gets better. I, I, um, and it's great also to break your duck for the 95 season. July 17, 1995, Fangio dies. Yeah, I think Fangio was the inspiration for almost everybody who's in this sport and who is looking for a role model of the perfect sportsman, the perfect competitor, and a great ambassador of the sport. I know that Senna, uh, with whom I was close friends, had the most trem tremendous regard for him. And one of the thoughts that came in my mind when I heard it this afternoon was that there are two giants who have left us in the last 18 months. You know, in, in motorsport, he was the uh, the most winningest driver for the, the, the minimum amount of starts, which is, uh, you know, a record that will probably stand for all time. And I think that uh, something that sums up best, um, you know, the reputation he had in the sport was the fact that probably the greatest driver of, of the uh, modern era, Ayrton Senna, held... Uh, find you as his, his own hero. Perhaps I can best explain, I saw Ascari, who was, I think, one of the greats as well, at Bari. He came around this corner in a real power slide, and he just touched the straw bale and went on, and every lap he was doing this. Fangio came round uh, in the same race, same sort of speed, same sort of power, but he didn't touch the straw, but he just flicked the straws. And to me, that just showed me the difference between just nudging it, I don't mean badly, just nudging it or just whispering it. And the, the skill that Fangio would drive, or the precision, was, I think, what set him apart. That, together with all the other things that uh, go to make a great driver, I mean, obviously concentration and so on, but uh, he was quite an exceptional driver. into the room the hush was silencing the man had such presence he was just such a special person and of course to motor racing the only man to win five uh, world championships still the greatest competitor in the history of formula one
In Argentina, Gerhard Berger had radioed in that his Ferrari was undrivable, suspecting a recurring damper problem. Thus, when he pitted on lap 14, he was immediately wheeled into the garage, only for his chief mechanic to spot a deflated right front tyre. So he was wheeled back out, refueled, and a new set of tyres mounted. And off back into the race after an 81 second stop. Sixth place at the chequered flag was a remarkable achievement. Mansell would finally make his 95 debut at Imola in a new wider McLaren MP410. My realistic hopes is to qualify as well as I possibly can, and uh, where that will be, I, I don't know. But to have reliability, and, and I'd like to uh, just finish the race, and if I can be in the points, then that'd be great too. A year after the tragic deaths of Roland Ratzenberger and Ayrton Senna, the Formula One circus returns to Imola for round three of the championship. And with Berger's red number 28 starting on the front row, the Tifosi have plenty to shout about. But first, one minute silence. Last year's winner, Michael Schumacher, had secured pole position. Berger on two, Coulthard three, Hill four, and Alacy five. At the green, Schumacher made the best getaway on a damp track. Formula One returnee Nigel Mansell made a first start and lost several places. Schumacher led Berger into the new Tamborello chicane. Mansell now comfortable in his McLaren cockpit with one of the few drivers to opt for dry weather tyres, but the decision proved premature. He was quickly engulfed by the midfield. So initially a Benetton led a Ferrari just as it ended last year. The back markers were to play an important role in the race. Schumacher dealt efficiently with Luca Badoa, but Berger almost stumbled upon the young Italian as they lapped him for the first time. With the track drying quickly, the decision on changing the tyres had to be made imminently. Berger was the first to change at the end of lap five. The Ferrari mechanics did a good job, but their man still lost three places and dropped a fifth. Schumacher now led Hill comfortably, avoiding a wayward backmarker in the process. Teammate Johnny Herbert enjoyed eventful first laps. He managed two spins, including this double 360 degree. After eight laps, Schumacher led the Williams of Coulthard and Hill with Berger and Alessi a little farther back. Lap 10 and Herbert was in, but couldn't stay. Schumacher was in the pits just metres behind, and the team couldn't accommodate them both. Hill followed Schumacher in, promoting Coulthard into the lead. Halfway into his first lap on slicks, Schumacher pushed too hard too soon. Imola's new safety measures being put straight to the test in what was a very big shunt. The drama promoted Berger into the lead to the delight of the crowd. Behind the Austrian, Hill was second while Coulthard and Alacy fought a fierce private battle for third place. One third distance, the two Ferraris almost sandwiched the two Williams, with Eddie Irvine nearly a full minute behind in fifth from Frentz and Sauber. Berger made his scheduled pit stop, having led for 11 laps, leaving Hill to take over the lead. But disaster struck, and precious time was lost. Hill was under pressure now from Coulthard and Alacy. Alacy was next to head for fuel and tyres on lap 26. 
Coulthard then hit trouble moments later with a spin, and in an instant, Hill took command of the race. The young Scott recovered and headed for the pits and a fresh set of tyres. Schumacher back from his earlier off, the Williams team learned that Coulthard had received a stop-go penalty for speeding in the pits after his last stop. This would almost certainly cost him his second place, if not more. On lap 35, he was in, the seventh driver in the race to experience the FIA's new and clearly efficient electronic policing methods. Not only is pit lane speed under scrutiny, but for the first time, jump starts. By now, Alexi was in a safe and lonely second place. Then Mansell was in for a new nose section, followed by Coulthard back in the pits yet again. Berger was running third. Mansell had been running fifth, but this coming together with Eddie Irvine dropped him to tenth at the finish. Irvine was not over happy at Mansell's return to Formula One. Despite what was going on behind him, Hill was controlling the race with ease, firmly on course for his 11th Grand Prix win and the second of 1995. In the closing laps, Berger's third place looked under some threat from a recovering Coulthard, and he was forced to up his pace, putting in the fastest lap. Reeling off the final laps, watched by an anxious Frank Williams and wife Georgie, Damon's win was the perfect riposte for the Williams team, one year on. For the expectant of these days, patient Tifosi. A win was not to be at Imola, but the signs are good for the season ahead, with Lacey finishing second and Berger third. A jubilant hill was now firmly leading the championship, six points ahead of Schumacher and Lacey. Coulthard was an eventful and eventual fourth, whilst Mika Hakkinen saved some McLaren pride with fifth place, and Heinz Harald Frensen scored another point for the Sauber team in sixth. There were 14 finishers in the end, more than many expected in this gruelling race. In Damon's battle with Schumacher for the championship, it was a useful 10-point advantage over the German. On a day when those around him made mistakes, Hill never put a foot wrong. Well, I think it was a difficult race because of the conditions at the beginning of, were pretty treacherous and uh, changing conditions and deciding when to go to slick tyres and trying to get through the back markers. Uh, all in all, there were a lot of uh, things in the race that would have made it very difficult to make him, uh, very easy to make a mistake. Schumacher's race was brief and it appeared to be all his own making. It's very easy to criticise race strategy afterwards. Possibly sometimes you get it wrong, sometimes you get it right. It's difficult to be terribly scientific about it. You can come up with computer programmes to try and predict this and predict that. At the end of the day, it's, it's down to the humans on the pit wall trying to make the decisions at the time. You can, in, for instance, start with a, a, a two-stop strategy and make it into a three-stop if you want to. You can drain down the fuel in the main tanks or you can raise it up. So there is flexibility there. Um, you usually need a lap or so's notice. But, uh, liaising with the driver, trying to make those decisions, it's, it's uh, fairly complicated. Williams adopt a seemingly loose approach to strategy, whilst Benetton take a more scientific view. Principally, I have to try and make the decisions on the pit stops, but with inputs from various other members of the team, including the driver, of course. We have a procedure, we have a program of running through the effect of fuel and the effect of tyres. Some of it's predicted from mathematical models and others, other parts that we actually do at the circuit there and then. And it's quite easy to look at the duration people are on their cars with the fuel rig to judge how much fuel they're putting in. And therefore, you can then start to predict what pit stops they're doing. With regard to how the team feel, I mean, I believe we've got the best team. 
in, in regard to pit stops, our boys are superb. And they just take a very professional view. It's part of the job. I won't pretend they want to do it. I don't think any of them enjoy refueling, but that's the, the task that's in front of them, and they get on with it in a professional way and accept it. While Schumacher would go on to win eight more races in 95, Hill would win only two. I think generally once you start on a strategy, you tend to stay there. Martin Brundle gets his first race in the number 25 Ligier, replacing Japanese driver Aguri Suzuki for Barcelona. While Olivier Parnis keeps his seat all year, Brundle and Suzuki will be in and out on numerous occasions. When and where, we'll keep you informed. A huge crowd greeted the fifth Spanish Grand Prix on the Catalonia track. Would Michael Schumacher bring an end to Damon Hill's winning streak? Schumacher was on pole ahead of the two Ferraris, Coulthard fourth and Hill back in fifth. Seen here through Eddie Irvine's camera, Coulthard makes a dreadful getaway, losing ground to Hill, Irvine and Hakkinen. Schumacher makes no mistakes and leads securely into the first corner ahead of Alesi. Hill's next up, followed closely by the other Ferrari of Gerhard Berger. Alesi's start was a scorcher, but he couldn't make up the ground Schumacher had from pole. At the end of the first lap, the German was firmly in command, leading a Lacey by more than a second and pulling away. Hill sandwiched between the Ferraris in third. Having disposed of Hakkinen, Coulthard was now battling for fifth with Eddie Irvine, the extra power of the Renault V10 allowing him to complete a bold move at the beginning of lap seven. Hill had to make an impression on Alesi soon, the Ferrari acting as a very efficient buffer between the Williams and the fast disappearing Schumacher. Ten laps in and the second place battle was now some seven seconds behind the leader. Would Hill act now or would he wait for the pit stops and resolve the problem of passing Alesi with a quicker stop? Lap 13, Hill is the first to come in, it's slow and he drops back to ninth place. All signs are that Hill's on a three-stop strategy, and expectations are that Schumacher is too. Coulthard is next, but the Benetton stays out. was Berger's turn. Third as he came in, he dropped back five places despite slick pit work from the Ferrari crew. Not only was Schumacher staying out, he was lapping quickest. Three laps later than Berger, Alesi was in from second, ahead of Hills Williams, but the Ferrari was in and out before Hill could take that second place. On lap 19, Mansell pulled into the McLaren garage and retirement. Twice winner in Barcelona, the former champion was less than happy with the handling of the McLaren, having earlier traversed one of the gravel traps. Finally, on lap 21, with a third of the race gone, Schumacher was in for the first time, and it looked as if he'd stop only twice. He resumed in the lead. By now, second place Alesi had Hill filling his mirrors from behind, and Brundle's Ligier, which he was trying to lap, holding him up at the front. The Ferrari horsepower seemingly unable to overcome Ligier's Mugens on the straight. On lap 26, the explanation for this apparent sluggishness came in a plume of white smoke. This was the first race retirement for Ferrari in 1995. No consolation, though, for Todd. The Benetton team suffered a near disaster in an otherwise copybook performance when Johnny Herbert, lying third, made his second and final stop.
incredibly, no one was hurt. Even the jack was undamaged when retrieved from the end of the pit lane. With 20 laps remaining and with more than a half a minute cushion to Hill in second, Coulthard Berger and the rest of the field, Schumacher made his second pit stop. The jack stayed with the mechanic this time and Schumacher rejoined still ahead of a charging Hill who closed to within 3.5 seconds, setting the fastest lap in the process. Lap 54 compounded a miserable day for McLaren with Mika heading straight for the garage. Williams instantly hit trouble too, Coulthard coasting to a halt with smoke pouring from the gearbox. The sudden loss of two front runners promoted Eddie Irvine to fifth, Barrichello to sixth and brought some encouragement into the Jordan camp. With Schumacher leading comfortably and Herbert lying third, Benetton looked clearly superior to Williams for the first time this year. It looked an easy lights to flag victory for the current champion. But last minute drama, Herbert had snatched second place after passing Hill less than a lap from home. A very frustrated Hill crawled over the line in fourth place. Faulty gearbox hydraulics having caused a spin. So, Schumacher's back. Johnny Herbert scored his best ever finish, and it's two wins apiece for Schumacher and Hill. After all the talk of Schumacher's inability to withstand pressure, Barcelona provided a convincing reply. I had this situation before where people thought I'm under pressure, where things happen. And I always gave uh, straight away back the answer, so I did now again. Certainly, uh, I'm happy for this as well, because if, for example, something would happen again mechanically, or people would st uh, start going on with this, but I think I couldn't prove better with full position and, and winning the race, uh, what is pressure uh, doing to me. Barcelona was Katayama's 50th start. If you put um, David, uh, Mike, David and uh, Johnny and myself in a room together, we could have a good laugh, you know. If you had Michael there, I don't think Michael would share the same sense of humour. Maybe, I don't know. After Barcelona, Nigel Mansell had had enough. Both he and the team concluded, unless irrespective of the performance of the team and the car, he could give 100%, and he wasn't really being honest to himself or the team. And in those circumstances, it was better not to continue the relationship. Carl Wendlinger was officially being rested by Sauber and would be replaced by Williams test driver Jean-Christophe Bouillon in Monaco. Basking in the Mediterranean sunshine, the tiny principality was hosting its 53rd Grand Prix. Hill had taken pole ahead of Schumacher and an impressive Coulthard. Hill got the start he needed, beating Schumacher off the line, but further back, chaos threatened. Alessi was squeezed towards the barrier by Coulthard. The two collided, causing mayhem. Berger was instantly eliminated too. Both Ferraris out at the first corner. In the ensuing traffic jam, Barrichello managed to maul teammate Irvine's front wings. It was disbelief at Ferrari. This was the view that Hill had in his mirrors. With only the two leaders away cleanly, there was little option other than to stop the race.
Ferrari had their work cut out, both drivers needing spare cars, a Williams for Coulthard and numerous repairs and replacement parts at Jordan. Schumacher and Hill could take time out to refocus on the new start, 15 minutes later. And the green light, Hill again outgunned Schumacher, but further back, no less than six cars were caught jumping the start. Schumacher tried harder this time, but could do nothing to get by Hill. In the second attempt, everyone was cleanly through the first corner. Although Hackenden and Herbert did come close. Down the hill from Casino Square, Schumacher locked up in his attempts to stay with the leading Williams. Coulthard clung to third from a Lacey, Berger and Herbert's second Benetton. Schiattarella could only watch both Simtex out of the running. With Schumacher filling Hill's mirrors at every opportunity, the leading duo were already pulling clear of Coulthard and the rest as the first of six jump starters made their way down the pit lane for their 10-second stop-go penalties. The Monaco six comprised Brundle, Barrichello, Parnis, Montemini, Frensen and Martini. Hill and Schumacher, meanwhile, were extending their lead to the rest of the pack by a second a lap. But Hill seemed unable to shake off the attentions of the Benetton. On lap nine, Hakkinen had to forfeit seventh place when his engine stopped on the start-finish straight, parking up at saint -Deveau. The two Ferraris were still hard on Coulthard's hills at one-fifth distance, albeit some 13 seconds behind the leaders. Remember, all three drivers were in their spare cars. Frensen, also in a spare car, dropped to 15th after serving his jump start penalty, but soon gained a place when Coulthard slowed and retired, his gearbox jammed in second. Strategy became the next item in the afternoon's programme of entertainment, and in particular that of Hill and Schumacher. Would they come in together or not? One stage Hill was more than two seconds ahead of Schumacher, but the advantage melted away as they got entangled with the back markers. It seemed unlikely, however, that the Benetton could pass, on the track at least. On lap 24, Hill peeled off into the pits as Schumacher carried on and took over the lead. Hill rejoined, but when Schumacher pitted 12 laps later, he lost his lead not to Hill, but to a Lacey who had just set fastest lap. The German had opted for just one stop, whilst the frustrated Hill would have to come in again. Suddenly, a Lacey was eliminated in this tangle with a lapped Brundle. Jean Todd could do nothing but watch. Berger chose Hill's strategy and pitted twice, out of contention for victory, but on course for third place. John Alesi was not a happy man. And neither was Frank Williams. Ron Dennis, on the other hand, had some cause to be satisfied. Mark Blundell, deputising for the departed Mansell for the third time this year, was heading for fifth and two world championship points. Sauber driver Frensen was looking at sixth spot after a troubled weekend and that earlier stop-go penalty. Ultimately, though, the day belonged to Benetton and Schumacher. It was Renault's first win in the Principality after 16 years of trying. For Damon, disappointment, second place and a missed opportunity to add his name to the trophy his father Graham won five times. Schumacher had dominated the race and scored his second consecutive win in the championship to make the score 3-2 in his favour. 
Berger enjoyed his fourth podium finish in five races, and Johnny Herbert followed up his fine second in Barcelona with fourth in Monaco. Grand Prix debutant Jean-Christophe Bouillon finished eighth in his Sauber. Things had looked so different at the post-qualifying press conference. I'm very confident because uh, I, know I felt like the car, the way I had it, I could drive it for 80 laps um, or so uh, well enough. You know, it was, it was comfortable to drive like that, and uh, that's vital. Um, I'm not too pessimistic. The gap we see now in qualifying uh, will s certainly not the, uh, the gap we're going to see tomorrow. And uh, I just hope we turn it around to another gap. Incredibly, Hill was nearly a second faster than Schumacher in qualifying. Yet on race day, the Benetton driver had clawed back that time and more. Hill and Williams have been beaten on all counts. I think that uh, I'm, I'm bitterly disappointed not to win here because uh, I thought the car was very good in qualifying. And uh, unfortunately, in the race, the car didn't match up to the way it uh, behaved in qualifying. And um, I can't really explain why that should be. Um, but uh, Michael drove a fantastic race, and again, Benetton did a better job of the strategy, and uh, you have to respect that and uh, congratulate them on a fantastic achievement. Monaco marked the last Grand Prix for Nick Worth's Simtek team. Lack of funds cited as the reason after a passionate last chance plea to his sponsors. Domenico Schiattarella scored the team's best result of 95 with ninth place in Argentina. And Jos Verstappen had been lying sixth in the same race before retiring with gearbox problems. The tunnel's a particularly interesting case, actually, because the tunnel, you have a roof. The tunnel roof actually affects the aerodynamics of the car because the upwash off the rear wing is deflected by the tunnel roof. And that actually causes a special problem because we tend to lose rear downforce in the tunnel. Um, and although it's flat, it's not comfortably flat for the drivers. To Montreal for round six and the Gilles Villeneuve circuit. Birthday boy Alessi was hoping to do the honours for Ferrari from fifth on the grid. In front were Berger, Coulthard Hill and on pole, Schumacher. Schumacher didn't make the greatest of starts but held his position as did the rest of the top five from Herbert, Hacken and Barrichello and Irvine in ninth. Into the hairpin for the first time, the leading group was safely through, but Hakkinen attempted an optimistic move on Herbert, and both cars were eliminated, little more than half a lap into the race. Two down, 22 left, but no need to halt things. Less than a lap later, Coulthard lost it on a wet patch under the bridge and skated off, leaving his third place to the battling Ferraris, who were lucky not to become entangled in the Scotsman's departure. Lacey managing to steal third place in the process. With Schumacher pulling out a gap over Hill, Lacey third, Berger fourth, and Barrichello and Irvine promoted to fifth and sixth, the race had begun to settle down halfway through lap two. In qualifying, Schumacher had been nearly half a second quicker than Hill, and in the race, the margin was proving equal, if not greater. Indeed, Hill was under increasing pressure from the two Ferraris behind. By lap 16, back markers were coming into play, and on the approach to the hairpin, Alessi made his move. It looked easy. David Brown was not impressed. By lap 20, Schumacher had a lead of some 11 and a half seconds. Lacey was second, and Hill was coming under increasing pressure from fourth-placed Berger. On lap 26, Berger saw his chance and squeezed through in an audacious move that saw him take third place at the most improbable passing place on the whole circuit. Lap 34, and Alessi was in for his one and only stop. Hill had chosen the same lap. And so had Jordan for Barrichello. Alessi would rejoin in third.
Hill fourth and Barrichello fifth. Berger was due in on lap 35, but the Ferrari, which had briefly moved to second place, was coasting. Number 28 had run out of fuel, and the Austrian was lucky to have enough momentum to eventually make it back to the pits. He would drop down to eighth. Schumacher didn't come in until lap 38, had no such problems, and rejoined with his comfortable lead intact. The Jordan team were enjoying their first decent Grand Prix of 95, but more than half distance, Barrichello and Irvine were running strongly in fourth and fifth places respectively. But it was a bad day for McLaren, with Blundell out on lap 48. Hill's woes were compounded three laps later, another gearbox problem sidelining the Englishman and significantly hampering his championship aspirations. Not a happy man. With 12 laps to go, Brundle and Berger were battling hard for sixth when they happened across a touring Schumacher, instantly promoting their fight to one for fifth. The champion had slowed moments earlier with a very sick-sounding Renault V10. The Benetton crew had a new steering wheel at the ready, and the young German, having lost a minute and a half, was sent back on his way, now down in seventh. With 11 laps remaining, Ferrari number 27 had taken the lead. Jordans were running second and third, Harness fourth. The battle for fifth was still unresolved until... In an instant, Schumacher was elevated to fifth place, with Gianni Morbidelli's arrows up to sixth. With two laps to go, nothing else now mattered. Only a few miles separated Alessi from his first win in 91 starts. For the Canadian fans, for the Tifosi back home, for Jean Todt, for Ferrari, and most of all for Jean Alessi, the chequered flag couldn't come soon enough. Barrichello, Irvine and their Jordan Peugeot V10s made it to the finish too. Ferrari couldn't have cut it finer. Half a lap past the flag, number 27 spluttered to a halt, out of fuel. There hadn't been a happier podium for a long time, and Alessi, celebrating his 31st birthday with his maiden victory, was now in the championship chase, only five points behind Hill and 12 behind Schumacher. For Damon Hill, Canada was a disaster, but luck cushioned the blow to his quest for the championship. A 10-point advantage was reduced to two when Schumacher's Benetton spluttered 12 laps from home, robbing him of almost certain victory. in Pau, Birmingham and spa francorchamps Jean took the Formula 3000 championship crown in 1989. Catching the eye of Ken Tyrrell, he was given his big break mid-season at Paul Ricard as replacement to Alvarado and finished a brilliant fourth. Another fourth in Spain and fifth in Italy saw him ninth in the championship. Jean was signed full-time for 1990 alongside Nakajima. After a phenomenal start, he had taken the lead in Phoenix from fourth on the grid. Senna wasn't having any of it. And the young Alessi wasn't having any of Senna. Next lap, the inevitable happened, but still Jean fought for every inch in what everyone acknowledged to be an inferior car. It finished second. With 
Another second in Monaco, again to Senna, Alesi was earning a reputation as a tough, if emotional, character. In 1991, Jean joined compatriot Alain Prost at the legendary Ferrari, but it would be a difficult season with nine retirements, either due to mechanical failure or of his own making. Alesi was not a lucky driver. Three third places were the highlights for him, whilst his aggressive style was the highlight for the crowds. 1992 and year two of what would go on to become a five-year stint with the Scuderia. A spate of retirements and ill fortune continued unabated. Nineteen ninety three and more of the same. The one highlight being a podium finish at Monza in front of his beloved and much adoring fans, the Tifosi. Nineteen ninety four was a better year for the Frenchman with podium finishes in Brazil, in Canada, and at mid season in Britain. And then, following that epic battle with Mansell in Japan, came another. But there was heartache too, in France, in Belgium, and worst of all, while leading at Monza. Year five at Ferrari started with fifth in Brazil, was followed by second in Argentina, then second in San Marino, and now after 91 Grand Prix, first in Canada. Then it was back across the water to round seven, Manny Corr. Damon Hill had qualified on pole position, and Schumacher, Coulthard and Alesi. Surprise performers were Barrichello fifth and Parnis sixth. Barrichello, however, would earn himself a 10-second start penalty and ruin his best qualifying performance of the year. At the lights, Schumacher shot across Coulthard's bow, but stayed behind Hill, who got away cleanly from his pole position. Barrichello benefited from his excellent start and snatched third from Coulthard. At the front, Hill was firmly in command with Schumacher, Barrichello and Coulthard next up. Alesi clung on to fifth temporarily as Hakkinen went around the outside of the hairpin. Alesi, never one to give up easily, was right under the McLaren's rear wing on the approach to the chicane when Finn found himself with no more road. He was lucky to somehow survive the gravel trap but lost four places. At the end of lap one, the order, Hill first, Schumacher half a second down in second, Barrichello third, Coulthard fourth, Parnis fifth, and Herbert sixth. Into the hairpin for the third time, and Alesi, deciding he'd been behind Herbert for long enough, made a lunge inside the Benetton. The two touched, exit Benetton number two, having completed a total of three laps in two races. Jump start penalties. Barrichello receiving 10 seconds for his misdemeanor. And Ligier's Olivier Parnis likewise. The Frenchman was plainly incensed and impatient. Having both lost some six positions, they rejoined in the thick of the midfield. Hill was still in the lead, but Schumacher was never more than a few tenths behind. The German clearly playing a waiting game. Lap 12, the two leaders approached Roberto Moreno to lap him. 
Hill appeared slightly hesitant, and Schumacher had a run-up. But the Briton was wise to the manoeuvre. Moving across to pass Moreno's 40, the German was boxed in. He had to back off, and the toe was lost. Hill first, Schumacher second. No change at the front yet. Lap 19, Schumacher was first to dive for the pits. Two laps later, Hill's turn. Too late, too slow. Benetton had once again beaten Williams where it mattered. Terse words on the pit wall, no doubt. Lap 22, fifth placed Berger was awaited by the Ferrari crew. Some 40 seconds were lost, and with it, any chance of points at the finish. Gerhard would rejoin back in 17th spot. Schumacher was already more than 10 seconds ahead of Hill by half distance. With Brundel in third from Coulthard, Alessi and Barrichello. Brundel would slip back to fourth, however, after his second stop of the afternoon, promoting Coulthard back up to third. Mika Hakkinen's McLaren and Olivier Parnis Ligier were embroiled in a battle for eighth as the clouds began to muscle in on the action. Would there be another factor determining the outcome of this race? With the crowd reaching for their umbrellas and the next wave of pit stops due, tyre strategy would be vital. Lab 43, Hill was in and for slick tyres. Eddie Jordan was less convinced but had other problems to contend with. Four laps later than Hill and despite a minor problem with one wheel, Schumacher was in and out, not just maintaining but extending his lead. Some way down the order, Gerhard Berger and Mark Blundell were enjoying a fierce tussle for 11th. Ferrari's Nicky Lauda was not impressed. Fifth place to Lacey was bearing down on them both, Berger moving over so as not to impede his teammate. Lap 55, Brundle stopped for the third and last time, again losing third to Coulthard. And Lacey was now trying to lap Blundell's McLaren. The Englishman certainly proving a trying temperament as far as the Ferrari driver was concerned. But Lacey was livid, and rightly so. Any hope of catching Brundle's Ligier lost. Brundle's chance was clear. Less than a second behind Coulthard now. Third, a real possibility before the chequered flag. Hill wasn't under threat from behind, but neither could he threaten Schumacher in front. The gap some 30 seconds between the Williams in second and the Benetton driver cruising to his fourth win of the year. Brundle kept up the pressure on Coulthard, but ultimately had to give way to the Scotsman, forfeiting the final podium place. Schumacher now had four wins, two hills, two. The Williams proving reliable this time, but lacking pace in the race. Ligier, celebrating their 300th Grand Prix, had figured strongly on home soil, thanks to Martin Brundle's efforts, and despite his jump start penalty, Rubens Barrichello snatched a point in the final reckoning. In the battle for the championship, Benetton had clearly given Schumacher an advantage. Hill and Williams would have to go back home and give their performance some serious thought. I think we were just uh, better prepared and just quicker in that race. My only real hope would have been to uh, really uh, stay ahead of him in the pit stops or hope that he was on a free stop, but um, there was no way I could uh, stay with his pace today and um, I have to make do with second place and we'll have to go back and um, think again for Silverstone. <laughs>
They arrived by helicopter, by plane, by car and on foot. International celebrities, royalty, politicians, sporting stars, corporations, sponsors, guests and fans from around the world. Formula One is enjoying record support. Sellout Grand Prix in 1995 included a world record 205,000 spectators on race day alone at the final race of the season in Australia. With 17 Grand Prix this year, the Formula One fraternity will have visited 13 countries, excluding the principalities of Monaco and San Marino, across five continents. Media coverage is at an all-time high, with more television, more radio, and more magazines and newspapers attending the races than at any other time in the championship's history. Massimiliano Max Pappis replaces Gianni Morbidelli at Arrows for round eight, the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. Damon Hill had claimed his fourth pole position of the year, but had dug very deep to achieve it against Schumacher sitting alongside. Once again, Barrichello was on the move before the green. the green. Hill managed to get away first, but all eyes were looking further back to Alessi making a stormer from six beneath the pit wall. Barrichello narrowly avoided a sluggish teammate and a fast-starting bundle in one go. Into Cots, it was Hill from Alessi, Schumacher, Coulthard and Herbert. Alessi would hold up Schumacher and Briatore knew it. So at the end of lap one, Hill was almost two seconds clear of the German and Alessi was in between. Coulthard still fourth, Herbert in fifth and Hakkinen sixth. Irvine's Jordan lasted but two laps with electrical problems. His Jordan teammate was lying in seventh, but the inevitable jump start penalty would drop him down the order. Not content to relinquish his second position, Alessi was giving Hill the opportunity to pull away at the rate of a second a lap. At one third distance, the first round of pit stops lose. Coulthard, the first of the leading bunch to make his stop, dropping him to eighth. Having climbed from 11th to 7th, Martin Brundle had thrown his Ligier into the gravel. With the loss of Irvine earlier, the British contingent had shrunk by one third. Berger's pit stop woes were set to continue at Silverstone. Note the wheelman on the front left. Lap 20, Hakkinen's McLaren retired with electrical failure and Berger's Ferrari courtesy of the wheelman on the front left. Lap 22, Hill was in for an 11-second stop, losing the 18-second cushion to Schumacher in second. Positions would be reversed, and Damon would rejoin 10 seconds behind. Further back, Alessi and Coulthard were fighting over four. Coulthard seemed quicker, but the Ferrari seemed very wide. Max Papis' debut lasted until lap 28. At exactly half distance, Schumacher made his one and only pit stop, handing the lead back to Hill. Damon was going for it, pushing hard to create the gap he would need for his second stop. Now that it was clear, Schumacher had opted for only one. 
Anesi was first in for the second stoppers, relinquishing fourth to Coulthard. Benetton were running different tactics for each of their cars. Herbert, like Hill and Alesi, on a two-stop strategy. He'd been lying third. The crucial stop was now imminent. It came on lap 41 and was a straight fight between Schumacher on the track and the Williams crew in the pit lane. Too late. With Hill having to stick to the pit lane speed limit, Schumacher outdragged him along the start-finish straight and into the lead. We would now be set for a battle royal. Similar fuel loads, but Hill with a tyre advantage, at least for half a dozen laps or so. Hill had to make that advantage count. In four laps, Hill was right on the German's gearbox. Lap 46 was the chosen moment. Through Bridge and into Priory, there was a whiff of a gap left open by Schumacher. It was all over. Hill was out, Schumacher was out, neither was happy. In an instant, we had a new race leader, Herbert. And in a repeat of the Schumacher-Hill battle for the lead, his Benetton was in front of a Williams, Coulthard. But the Scot had incurred an earlier penalty for speeding in the pit lane, and he would have to come in. It didn't prevent him from attacking Herbert first, and passing. Finally, it was over at the end of lap 51. Coulthard was in and Herbert was clear in front. Lacey was thus promoted to second, Coulthard resuming in third. Three laps to go, the top three settled. Mundell's McLaren and Barrichello's Jordan were locked in a battle for fourth. The Brazilian was climbing all over the tail of the McLaren when... Blundell defended, Barrichello didn't react in time and the Brazilian was very lucky not to be flipped as the out-of-control Jordan hit the gravel trap. Blundell was able to keep going, albeit with difficulty. At the front, Herbert was stroking at home, unable to believe his luck, but on course for a thoroughly deserved first victory in Benetton's fifth of the 1995 season. Even Schumacher managed a grin amidst the Benetton celebrations. Alesi wound up second, Coulthard third, Parnis nipped past Blundell for fourth, and the McLaren made it to the flag minus a left rear tyre for fifth. The final point was taken by the patient Heinz Harold Frensen in the Sauber. In the championship, Schumacher maintained his 11-point margin at the head of the table, but Alesi was now just three points shy of Hill, and Herbert had added ten to his tally, moving him ahead of Coulthard. <laughs> Memories of Adelaide 94 were at the top of most people's thoughts about the incident on lap 46 between Hill and Schumacher. Neither contender admitting fault, Hill claiming it to be a racing incident, and Schumacher placing all the blame at the Englishman's feet. A microphone in the mouth just added insult to injury. In 1988, Johnny was on the crest of a wave in Formula 3000 before this horrific crash at Brands Hatch looks certain to have ended a promising career. That Johnny returned to racing at all, let alone Formula 1, is quite remarkable. 
but Peter Collins of Benetton had faith in Herbert's ability to return, and Johnny, in some considerable discomfort, made his Benetton debut in Brazil, scoring a brilliant fourth-place finish. A fifth place at Phoenix followed, but by mid-season, Johnny was forced out by Benetton, despite Collins' demands he should stay. A one-off appearance in Belgium for Tyrrell followed, but Formula One seemed over for Herbert. 1990 saw Johnny in Japanese Formula 3000. But following Martin Donnelly's massive accident in Spain, Johnny got a break with Lotus for the final two Grand Prix of the year. The Lotus Lamborghini was not a good car, but at least the young Briton was back and able to put himself in the frame for 1991. It wasn't until Canada that Herbert got his chance, but Peter Collins was now at the Lotus helm. And following the departure of Julian Bailey, Herbert was back and alongside Mika Hakkinen. Results were sparse for the underfinanced team, seventh in Belgium, the highlight for Herbert. Lotus were in no better shape the following year, again lack of finance cited as the reason. But sixth places in South Africa and France saw Johnny to 14th in the World Championship. Nineteen ninety three was the most successful to date, three fourth places, securing ninth in the championship by the season's end. They came in the Brazilian Grand Prix at Interlagos, where he battled brilliantly with Schumacher's Benetton lap after lap. very damp Donington Park, the host of the European Grand Prix, and also Silverstone. 1994 started frustratingly, and the relationship with Lotus was souring. Monza provided the one and only highlight, fourth in qualifying courtesy of a revised Mugen Honda engine. Even that turned sour when Irvine took him out at the start. He then had to use the spare car with an old spec engine, retiring soon after the restart. His final race for Lotus came at Estoril. By Spain, he was in a Ligier in a surprise move. And then at the very next race in Japan, he was in a Benetton alongside Schumacher and replacing Jos Verstappen. But these last two races in Japan and Australia were hardly vintage performances. 1995 has seen him stay at Benetton, scoring a fine second place in Spain before winning at Silverstone, but more was to come, a second victory in Monza. In the ongoing game of musical chairs at Ligier, Brundle gets to stand while Suzuki gets the seat. Further down the pit lane, Pacific's Bertrand Gasho makes way for someone called Giovanni Labaggi. This stunning news in time for round nine at Hockenheim. More than 120,000 Germans have come to see Michael Schumacher become the first German to win his home Grand Prix since the championship officially got underway in 1950. Damon Hill, on the other hand, was out to spoil the party, taking pole position by a little under a tenth of a second. Berger was the guilty party this time, as Hill made the best start, splattering Schumacher with oil and water from the back of the Williams. Unlike last year, the field made it cleanly through turn one, Hill already pulling clear of Schumacher. Barrichello was in fighting mood and pressed Hacken and hard before powering past the McLaren on the long second straight. The Brazilian now in pursuit of Jordan teammate Eddie Irvine. Before the end of lap one, Barrichello had done it. Berger was fourth, Coulthard third, Schumacher second, and Hill leading by a little over a second. Then, disaster. For the patriotic crowd, it was heaven sent. Schumacher had been gifted the lead, and his prime challenger was out of the race. For Hill, it was devastating, and he was lucky to escape unhurt. Frank Williams' emotions hidden deep within. With Schumacher now in the lead, Coulthard was elevated to second, Berger third, Barrichello fourth, Hakkinen was up to fifth, ahead of Irvine sixth. 
Berger's movement at the start was soon punished with a standard 10-second penalty notification. So Barrichello could afford to be patient in his attempts to move into third. Ferrari were far from impressed. Gerhard would drop back down the order to 14. Ferrari were now in trouble, Alesi stopping several laps earlier than planned, the resulting chaos costing some 30 seconds, slipping the Frenchman down to 15. The incensed Berger was inspired into a charge, retaking three places in two laps to close on Frenson and Herbert. One lap after his earlier stop, Alesi was back in, engine problems forcing him to retire. Parnis Ligier was the next to hit trouble, overheating his clutch after the first stop. Walkinshaw could only hope, but his prayers went unanswered. Number 26 coasting to a halt before rejoining the track. Irvine too had his problems, the throttle variety and more importantly lack of. Barrichello easily repassing after his first pit stop. Having got by Frinson, Berger was up to eighth and chasing Herbert. Lap 17, Coulthard was a lonely second, and Blundell's McLaren chose the opportunity to retire. Two laps later, Schumacher came in for the first of his two stops, passing the lead to the sole surviving Williams. It was a quick stop, but Hakkinen had slipped by two, so Schumacher was back in third. Barrichello was next, fourth, but not for the first time this season, his Peugeot V10 had had enough. Rubens became casualty number 10 in a race that still had six more retirements to contribute. By lap 22, Schumacher was ahead of Hakkinen and closing on Coulthard in the lead with a succession of fastest laps. Lap 23, Coulthard was in for his one and only stop, 15.5 seconds. Schumacher thus assumed a lead of some 20 seconds, but still had a second stop to make. Berger was in too, having by now climbed back up the order to fourth place, and Herbert followed, but unlike Berger, lost position to Frenson. Suzuki, meanwhile, was having fun down in eighth. After three laps behind Frenson Sauber, Herbert took back his fourth place. The Sauber wouldn't last much longer, though, and on lap 32, retired with engine problems. A lap later, Hakkinen joined him, a similar problem affecting his Mercedes. Berger thus inherited third, before Schumacher's second and final stop came with just ten laps to go. Coulthard was closing all the time, and the Benetton pit crew were under pressure. He wasn't close enough, though, and as the German accelerated out of the pit lane, Coulthard was only just arriving on the start-finish straight. With eight laps remaining, Schumacher's lead was nearly nine seconds, and Coulthard appeared unable or unwilling to chase. With four laps to go, Irvine's Jordan finally gave up the ghost, and with it, the point for sixth place. No such problems for Schumacher. His fifth win of the season was typically dominant and all the more satisfying in front of his own fans. Coulthard was second, Berger third and Herbert fourth. A lap down, Bouillon managed fifth and Suzuki sixth before the musical Ligier seat got a little too hot. In the battle for the championship, Schumacher now had a healthy 21-point advantage over rival Hill. And teammate Herbert's fourth place was enough to keep him ahead of the other Williams driver, David Coulthard. Understandably, Schumacher was pretty pleased with himself afterwards. I have said that I won last year the championship which is certainly fantastic to be the, the first German world champion, but to win the first uh, German race here in Hockenheim in front of such a crowd is, is just unbelievable. And I, I said already that this is going to be more worth for me than to win another championship this year. I mean, the championship is, is fantastic, but to win a race in front of your home crowd, it's something unbelievable. And uh, 
I'm going to enjoy this for a long, long time now. The German might also enjoy Hill's demise for some time too. Damon was devastated by his off and at a loss to know what had happened. I was pushing hard, trying to pull out an advantage, but uh, I must say I've been around that corner enough times this weekend to, to know whether I'm within the limits of it or not. And, um, you know, I just... The first time, it, the first time I see the English have the heart. <laughs> because I see my mechanic cry, honestly. I can imagine. I mean, the first time I cry in the podium, the first time in my life. In one uh, spa, I never cry. Today was the day. And my mechanic arrived in the garage, everybody crying. For Shumi's fans, it was the perfect day. It's very difficult to overtake. Difficult, but not impossible. at Silverstone, Michael Schumacher and Damon Hill both expressed their views about the difficulties of overtaking. It's a problem we have in Formula 1. You can't drive too close to each other. I knew Damon is going to have this five laps momentum with his new tyres and that's it. And I knew I had to take care particularly in backwards before we come to hangar straight to have their uh, big enough gap that he is not able because I knew as well he is running high at top speed that he's not able to gonna overtake me into Stowe, into Priory. I think uh, there's, no, <clears throat> there's no way that you, after the circuit has changed into, I mean, a shorter straight now, there's no way of overtaking them. I've tried to pass him, I think, a few times now, and uh, I think it's only once I've got past. Uh, it's just very difficult to pass in Formula 1 cars these days, and uh, if someone wants to make it difficult for you to pass, it's very easy. There are ways, as Michael explains. If you have a driver who is over-optimistic, already in karting I have done this, I left him in through the uh, inside and then I passed him again. So there are ways around this if you have a driver. As well, when you want to pass a driver and you are inside and he just closes the door like stupid, then there are ways to, to react more clever than uh, your competitor. While 1995 has seen some outstanding manoeuvres on the track, increasingly pit stop strategy has become the primary tool in the battle to get past the car in front. And the grandmaster of this game appears not to be a driver, but a team, Benetton. Guri Suzuki is not a happy man. After all the fun at Hockenheim, Brundle gets the Ligier hot seat back for Hungary. Pierre Luigi Martini has to vacate his seat at Minardi in favour of the Portuguese driver Pedro Lamy. Two weeks after Hockenheim, the German contingent was once again out in force for round 10, Hungary. Amidst enormous speculation that Schumacher was about to sign a contract with Ferrari for 1996, Damon Hill got on with a job of qualifying and took his fourth consecutive pole position of the year, six-tenths faster than the German. Coulthard joined his teammate on the front row. He was four-tenths off, while Schumacher had Berger alongside and Hakenham behind. 
Hill's start was immaculate, whilst behind Schumacher's was less so, having to move over in order to block Hakkinen slipping past. Barrichello, back in 14th, was quick too, passing Badoa and Blundell on the short run up to turn one. The first corner passed without incident. Hill out in front from Coulthard, Schumacher, Berger, and then a three-way scrap over fifth. At the end of lap one, Hill had put over a second between himself and Coulthard, with Schumacher nearly three down in third, Berger fourth, Hakkinen fifth, and Brundle sixth. Alexis Ferrari maintaining a watching brief in seven. There was panic in the Ferrari pit, however, a faulty air rig needing urgent attention before either car could be allowed to come in for tyres. Berger's fourth position looked more secure at the start of lap four when Hakkinen became the first retiree, his Mercedes blowing unceremoniously on the start-finish straight. Schumacher was still trapped behind Coulthard, unable to find a way past the Scotsman, he was losing valuable time to Hill. With Ferrari nearly sorted in the pit lane, Coulthard made an error into the chicane on lap 13. Running wide onto the dirt, he couldn't recover before Schumacher grasped the opportunity and was through on the way into the next left-hander. With both Williams and Benetton deciding three stops per driver would be needed, Hill came in on lap 17, 12 seconds ahead of Schumacher. It was enough to turn the Williams around and get him out just as Schumacher was heading for his box, the two nearly colliding. With Schumacher back on his way, the Benetton crew discovered a problem with the fuel rig and the German hadn't taken on enough fuel. He would have to stop again sooner than originally planned. Just nine laps later, he was back in. With Coulthard coming up to the start-finish straight, it would be touch and go as to whether Schumacher could hang on to second. He made it. Just. At the front, Hill was half a minute ahead and really pushing hard, setting the fastest lap in his efforts to extend his lead. Lab 42, Barrichello closed dramatically on fifth place. Alesi flying past the Ferrari with such ease that Alesi must have had some kind of problem. One lap later, and just as in Hockenheim two weeks previously, Alesi pulled in to retire. An engine problem once again the cause. Hill had made his second stop on lap 38. Schumacher was now less than a second behind, piling on the pressure. A slight error on lap 47, nearly costing the Englishman the lead. Lap 48, Schumacher was back in the pits for his third and final stop. Berger's Ferrari was in two. As was Barrichello's Jordan, the Brazilian maintaining the advantage thanks to the Jordan crew. Katayama had departed the fray on lap 46, the Japanese enduring a long walk back to the Tyrrell motorhome. Blundell was closer to home on lap 54, another engine, and Irvine's clutch lasted up until lap 70. Incredibly, it was Schumacher's turn next. Fuel pump failure leading to his first mechanical retirement of the 1995 season. Hill could now relax with a comfortable advantage on Coulthard, himself nearly a lap ahead of Barrichello in third. Berger couldn't, though. Herbert and Frenson snapping at the Austrians' heels for fourth place. With one lap remaining, Williams looked set for their first 1-2 since Portugal 1994, and Damon for his first win since the San Marino Grand Prix four and a half months earlier. It duly came at the end of lap 77. Barrichello was en route for third when suddenly he slowed in sight of the finish, instantly promoting the Berger Herbert Frenson scrap to a fight for the final podium position. The Brazilian was distraught, Parnis pipping him to even sixth spot. But it was Hill's day, winning his 12th Grand Prix on the circuit where he scored his first ever win just two years previously. He'd started at the front, stayed in front, and set the fastest lap in the process. The Englishman was now just 11 points behind Schumacher in the title chase, with Coulthard displacing Herbert by a point and moving up to fourth. No longer the gutted and dejected Damon Hill of Hockenheim. Following this race, it was confident fighting talk from the winner.
when you uh, you bust the gut for 77 laps, and then you uh, you're pretty puffed out, and you get on the rostrum. But when they're cheering like that, it's fantastic, it really is. Well, everything went to plan. We knew what we were doing. We knew where we were in in the race. We knew what we had to do, and I think we were pretty well in control. The car was bloody good. I think the chips are down now, and I, I have to win, but uh, it's certainly a bonus, uh, Michael having a, a DNF. For Schumacher, a non-finish was a shock. He had been confident of at least second place, even with the refueling problems encountered at his first stop. There was a problem with the machine, which uh, made us a big problem then for the rest of the stops. We had to put in a lot more fuel, plus we had to run uh, a lot longer with the, with the tyres, which I would say... Us. But nevertheless, I think it would have been okay to run in second. We, we gave them a hard time, the hardest we could, but then uh, it was a bit unfortunate to stop uh, just five laps or four laps to the end. I think we had him beaten even if he'd uh, carried on going. by the fact that we didn't finish and if you think now uh, the championship is now for me it's only 15 races and I've given everyone 10 points uh, Michael 10 points advances the championship is going to be very very tough gearbox problems cost 10 points in Brazil six became three in Spain four were lost in Canada with pump failure gear change difficulties cost Schumacher eight points in Canada Something cost Hill another potential 10 in Germany. While Schumacher lost six at the Hungaro ring. Coulthard went from 10 to four and finally nothing in Argentina with electrical failure. Another four went up in smoke in Barcelona. Followed by four more in Monaco. Gearbox again, and that dreaded box would take a further ten in Belgium. The next round in the World Championship at the picturesque Spa Francorchamps circuit. Gerhard Berger, 36 years old, on race morning, would start from pole position. Teammate Alessi shared the front row, with Hakkinen third and Herbert fourth. Hill was back in eighth and Schumacher even further behind in 16th, both having suffered problematical wet qualifying sessions. Beneath ominous skies, Alessi made a stormer of a start as Berger faltered, causing Hakkinen to take avoiding action. Irvine's Jordan made light contact with Coulthard ahead, but otherwise everyone was safely through La Source. Alessi was in front, and despite Herbert's aggressive intent, led the way through Eau Rouge. Up the hill to Les Combe, it was the Englishman who proved the braver. A brief puff from the brakes, and he was through. Alessi down to second, and Berger in third. With one lap completed, the top three were unchanged. Hakkinen was fourth, Coulthard fifth, and Hill up to sixth. Leaving La Source, Hakkinen lost the rear end, out after just one lap. Up to Les Combes for the second time. Alessi was the braver, regaining the lead. But after four laps, he was in. Believing he had a puncture, he was incensed at the unprepared Ferrari crew. He was wrong. The rear suspension had failed and Alessi became the second retirement in a long afternoon. Lap five and Herbert was leading again but under pressure from Coulthard. The Scott attacked and Herbert obliged with a spin, dropping back to sixth behind Schumacher who was now fifth. Lap ten and it was fourth, passing Irvine's Jordan at bus stop. Lap 13, Coulthard rolled to a halt. Gearbox failure depriving him of a potential win. Hill thus assumed the lead. Berger second and Schumacher third.
Lab 15, Hill was in for his first scheduled stop. As Berger followed, it was Schumacher who assumed the lead. In 16 laps, he had leapt from 16th to 1st. With Hill rejoining in 2nd, Parnis and Brundle now found themselves 3rd and 4th. Three laps later, Schumacher was into the pits and Hill back in front. Berger's sole surviving Ferrari hit electrical trouble on lap 19. He radioed in and pulled in, having completed just 20 of the 44 laps. On lap 21, the skies broke and Hill was in for wets. Schumacher wasn't, preferring to chance it on slicks, he retook the lead. But Herbert decided on wets too, catching his crew by surprise. For Irvine and Jordan, there were more serious problems. The dreaded threat of a refueling fire had reared its head. Fortunately, no one was injured. Lap 23, and with Hill on wets against Schumacher Slicks, the Williams was soon with the German and fighting for the lead. What followed was to one a legitimate blocking manoeuvre, and to the other a deliberate attempt to have him off. Lap 24, same place, same two drivers, but this time a different result. Schumacher outbreaking himself and lucky to keep going. Lap 25 and Hill slid wide, Schumacher retaking the lead. With the rain having stopped, Hill was back in for slicks. At exactly the wrong moment. The heavens opened and out came the safety car. Schumacher was straight in and onto wets. Hill followed, losing nothing to the German whilst the safety car held him back. But. Damon had just edged past the limit on that last stop. Brundle was now second, 15 seconds ahead of Hill. Blundell and Frensen were fighting over fourth. The battle determined in the Germans' favour with four laps to go. For Peter Sauber, it was his team's best performance so far this year. With just one lap to go, Hill was right with Brundle approaching La Sorte's hairpin. It was tight. It was tense. And at the end of the long climb into Les Com, it was all over. Hill second, Brundle demoted to third. Schumacher cruised across the line to score his 16th career win, where four years previously he'd scored his first. With Hill in second and Brundle in third, Frensen, Blundell and Barrichello were left to sweep up the remaining championship points. Schumacher had extended his lead at the head of the championship table by four points, and with Alessi, Coulthard, Herbert and Berger all failing to score, the principal championship rivals had furthered the gap to the rest. After the race, attention focused on the incident on lap 23, the two rivals unsurprisingly differing in their views. I knew it's going to dry out, I knew he had, he had this momentum where he might be quicker, and I think we had a pretty tight run. I uh, certainly was defending uh, the position and it got very tight, but I think we, we done it in a situation where it was uh, quite easy. We, n uh, we didn't do it in high speed corners and in slow speed corners nothing can really happen if you drive that close and I just took that risk. Yeah, that's all fair, uh, it's all well and good if it's accidental, but if it's uh, meant on purpose then I'd be pretty upset. And. Um you know, uh, I think it's all very well to have a close race, and I, I enjoyed it. Everyone enjoyed watching it, but, uh, you know, um, these are Formula 1 cars, they're not go-karts, as I've heard someone say once before. And um, so, but congratulations to him for coming from 16th to win the race. Um, you must try go-karts. They're good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not go-karts, as I said. Now a chance to see exactly what went wrong for Eddie Irvine.
from the first spark to the last flicker, the whole incident was over in less than six seconds, thanks to slick work by Jordan and Ligier fire crews. The fuel leak out that went far, went far. Eddie was both unhurt and unfazed by the whole experience. Round 12 and Monza, no Ferraris on the front row for the home crowd, David Coulthard having dominated qualifying, taking pole position by nearly six tenths from Schumacher. First Ferrari was Berger on row two, joined by Hill fourth and Alacy fifth, as the car set off on the formation lap and drama. Coulthard spinning off on the exit of Ascari. Later, he would blame oil on the track as the cause, but in any event, he was now out of the race. Schumacher got away first, just Berger threatening on the way down to the Variante Goodyear. Herbert slipped past Hill under, breaking for the first chicane to claim fourth behind Alacy. Heading towards Parabolica, the order had settled to Schumacher first, Berger second, Alacy third, Herbert fourth, Hill fifth and Hakkinen sixth. Further back, a spin from Papis triggered a pile-up. Bouillon was out, Moreno was out, and Montemini too. Red flag. With less than a lap completed, a new race was declared. Coulthard couldn't believe his luck. Not only could he now start the race, but from his pole position too. Moreno and Montemini would take no further part, however. Start two. Coulthard got a flyer. Berger was quick off the mark again, this time taking Schumacher under braking for Variante Goodyear. Not elegant, but no less effective. With everyone making it through the first chicane unscathed, it was Coulthard leading the field across the line at the end of lap one. Berger second, Schumacher third, Hill fourth, Alacy fifth and Herbert sixth. After 10 laps, Brundle's Ligier was out, a slow puncture developing into something much worse. Lap 14, more drama for Coulthard. Berger had snatched the lead now and the Tifosi were ecstatic. Coulthard made it back to the pits, but retirement was instant. A failed front wheel bearing the cause of the earlier spin. Lap 24, Schumacher second, Hill third, Taki Inui in the way. Bang! For the second time this year, the pair are off and the controversy immense. Schumacher straight over the hill to vent his anger. For Berger, the pressure was off in an instant, but he still pressed hard. Lap 25, Berger was in for his one scheduled stop, a long one, dropping him down to sixth. That gave teammate Alacy the lead, 13 seconds ahead of Barrichello. But only for one lap, Alacy's stop was next. Barrichello became the next one lap leader before he was in, promoting Hakkinen for one lap too. Alacy was being held up by Irvine, the Irishman on his way to the pits. Johnny Herbert had his turn at the front for two laps before pitting at the end of lap 30, dropping back to third. With all the reshuffling, Ferraris were back in front, Alacy just ahead of Berger. Everything looked good for the first Ferrari 1-2 in a very long time when, lap 33, Alacy's camera flew off, bouncing into Berger's left front suspension. The Austrian was out. Lap 41, one half of the Jordan pairing was out. Eddie Irvine's engine. Lap 44, Jordan were completely out of it when Barrichello's clutch exploded. With just nine laps remaining and Alacy cruising to his second victory of the year, smoke started a pour from the right rear wheel of number 27. Two laps later, it was all over. Wheel bearing failure, the culprit. The popular Frenchman was in tears behind his helmet.
Johnny Herbert was now the new race leader with a margin of some 18 seconds over second place Mika Hakkinen. The French and Sauber elevated to third. For Johnny, it was a second gifted victory this year, but deserved no less after all the years of frustration. Mark Blundell brought the second McLaren home in fourth place, the first time since Brazil that both McLaren and Mercedes finished in the points. Mika Salo took fifth and Jean-Christophe Bouillon sixth. In the Drivers' Championship, Schumacher and Hill are unchanged, while Johnny now leaps to third place with 38 points. Further down the table, Hakkinen moves up to eighth from 13th, Blundell ninth from 11th. Schumacher and Hill were at the centre of controversy once again. Here we can see how first Hill... ...and then Schumacher saw the incident. Unfortunately, we can't tell you what was said here. It was Taki Anui who they were both lapping at the time. Here he guides us through the memorable moments of his first full season in Formula One. I don't know. I actually, my driving is, I believe, is getting better. I'm just at the moment getting very popular with the wrong direction. Okay, not as a driver, but uh, yeah, that's it. That's the incident. I, I didn't do it on purpose. But that thing is, uh, that thing is uh, happen. So, but I don't know. Uh, that is a uh, lucky or unlucky. But still, actually, first in the incident, I had uh, just a neck problem. Okay. Still just, just a little bit painful. And also the, as my leg is painful as well. Then toothache as well. I don't know why. Well, I think the only craziest thing I've ever done is try to get in the bath with Mika Hakkinen when I was at Lotus. That's about the only craziest thing I've done, I think. And it didn't work. I didn't get in the bath. Jean-Denis Delatraz replaces Lavaggi at Pacific in time for round 13 of the championship at Estoril in Portugal. For the second race running, David Coulthard had qualified on pole position, four tenths quicker than teammate Damon Hill. A similar margin ahead of third place Schumacher. Undoubted star of qualifying though was Frensen, fifth in the Sauber, his best performance this year. David Coulthard made a perfect getaway, ahead of Hill, Schumacher, Berger and Frensen. Further back, though, there was trouble as Katayama's Tyrrell was launched into the air after hitting Luca Badoa's Minardi. It looked horrific, and the race was immediately brought to a halt. Thankfully, though severely shaken, he was unhurt, but would take no further part. Almost unnoticed, Frensen had been pushed into a spin by Brundle at the first corner. The young German would be glad of a restart. Second time around, Coulthard was equally impressive. On the run down to turn one, too much wheel spin from Hill off the line was converted into the loss of second place. Schumacher going the long way round. Coulthard had the wick fully turned up at the end of lap one and was more than a second ahead of Schumacher with Hill third, Berger fourth, Herbert fifth and a Lacey sixth. As early as lap two, the young Scott had set fastest lap, extending his lead still further. Back in ninth, Barrichello was leading Hakkinen, Blundell and a fast recovering Frensen. The German having stalled at the start of the formation lap prior to the restart and therefore having got away from the back of the grid. It wasn't until lap 17 that Hakkinen nipped past the Jordan. Lap 18, Schumacher came in and was followed immediately by Hill. Seven point four seconds and Schumacher was on his way. Hill was stationary for sixteen point one.
Next time around, it was Coulthard's turn. 10.1 seconds. He retained his lead. Frensen continued his rapid progress through the field, and by lap 30, he was eighth, having dispensed with Blundell, Barrichello and Hakkinen. Lap 35, Schumacher was in for the second time. And on lap 38, so too was Coulthard. With Hill staying out, it became clear that the Englishman was employing different tactics, not just to Schumacher, but also his teammates. But by lap 44, Coulthard had caught up and was much the quicker man. By the end of the lap, Hill was in for stop number two. Hakkinen's Mercedes chose the moment to call it a day. Lap 54, Coulthard and Schumacher stopped for the last time. Coulthard retaining his lead. Schumacher slipping behind Hill. In seven laps, the German had caught Hill's Williams. Then on lap 62, he was passed, catching Hill napping. Some 10 seconds in front, Coulthard was heading for victory. His first. With the two Ferraris just short of being lapped, Coulthard crossed the line to win. His first outright success on his 21st attempt. Becky Herbert, the first to congratulate his girlfriend, Andrea. It was a copybook performance from David. Pole position, fastest lap, race win. And thoroughly deserved after so many near misses this season. Schumacher took second, Hill third, Berger fourth, Alacy fifth, and Frenson sixth from the back of the grid. As far as the championship is concerned, the result gives Schumacher a further two-point advantage over Hill. But for Coulthard, he now regains third place, putting himself back ahead of Herbert and Alacy. The performance of the Williams would certainly give Schumacher something to think about, whilst for Hill, that 16-second pit stop and a 17-point deficit with just four races remaining would seriously dent his chances in the championship. There is certainly a, a point difference between me and Damon, which uh, I'm certainly more happy about than it would be the other way around. But nevertheless, uh, the performance they're putting on now and they're going to put on, it's going to be difficult for us, but uh, we're not going to sleep. Uh, the team on uh, David's car who have had a number of races when it didn't work out for him and so uh, and for David you know it's uh, it's good news for them and uh, it's good for the team because uh, we have the prospect now of putting two cars between us and uh, and the next car and um, that is a possibility but for the championship I would say 17 points with only four races to go is looking a bit a little bit out of reach David's Formula One debut came at the Spanish Grand Prix in 1994, following the tragic loss of Ayrton Senna. He was destined to retire from that first Grand Prix with electrical problems, but fifth in Canada, fifth in Britain, and fourth in Belgium followed. At Monza, he was lying a fine second behind teammate Damon Hill, until, with less than a lap to go, he mysteriously ran out of fuel and dropped to sixth. His final race came in Portugal, where he led strongly before waving Hill by in a move designed to aid Hill's quest for the championship. It was another strong showing by the young Scotsman, his best result of the eight races in which he took part, and ultimately enough to earn him a place at Williams in 1995. Nigel Mansell took over from there on in. All David could do was watch and wait. Nineteen ninety five started with third on the grid in Brazil, leading to a second place in the race while still recovering from a bout of tonsillitis.
His first ever Formula One pole position came in round two, Argentina, and after a great start, he led the race easily. Before an electrical problem robbed him of the lead. Shortly after retaking second place, a total failure caused his retirement. Round three, San Marino was less successful. Spinning while trying to stay with teammate Hill. Barcelona saw him retire while third with gearbox problems and again at Monaco before Canada and a spin on a damp patch on lap one. France was a close third, just holding off Brundle. And in Britain, he took the lead, only to suffer a 10-second pit lane speeding penalty, dropping him to third at the finish. Hockenheim, another third place. While in Hungary, it was second as part of the Williams 1-2. In Belgium, the lead was lost with gearbox failure. And in Italy, the lead was lost to wheel-bearing failure before that all-important first win in Portugal. Following Ukio Katayama's accident in Estoril and the severe shaking he received, the Japanese has to sit out round 14. And Gabriele Tarquini, Tyrrell's test driver, is drafted for Nürburgring, this year host of the European Grand Prix. With Coulthard achieving his third consecutive pole, Hill lined up second, Schumacher third, and the only man on slicks on a wet track, Alessi, back in sixth. Papez stalled, causing a delay, then Frensen jumped the start before Coulthard got his now customary flyer. Hill didn't and was immediately passed by Schumacher and Irvine. So Coulthard led Schumacher second, Irvine third and Hill fourth. Hill was quick to make amends, passing Irvine halfway around lap one. As early as lap five, the slick shot of Lacey was beginning to move forward, passing Herbert for fifth. Frenson had taken off like one at the start. The penalty was inevitable. Hill was quickly onto Schumacher's tail and climbing all over the Benetton. The German pulling every trick to stay in front. On lap 11, both were in for slicks. Schumacher was on his way in a record time. The Williams stationary for a further three seconds. Lap 12 and Coulthard, race leader, was in. And Lacey's gamble had paid off. Number 27 running P1. Berger, fifth now, had Hill closing rapidly. And on lap 14, he was through. It wasn't long before he was back with Schumacher. Lap 16 and Hill was passed, Schumacher forcing him to the outside. Half a lap later and a small mistake allowed Schumacher back through. Still the battle raged, Hill pushing, Schumacher defending. With Alessi still comfortably in front, the battle was closing on second place Coulthard. The Scot about to lap Hakkinen hesitated. Schumacher was through and Hill balked. Would Coulthard let Hill through? Two laps later, Coulthard waved his teammate by and Hill was free to chase again. Alessi, leading by some 30 seconds, was struggling with traffic. First Herbert and Barrichello, then Irvine. The Irishman managed a more thorough job on Herbert and paid the price. At exactly half distance, Alessi made his one stop, keeping the lead. 
Benetton were ready for Schumacher's second stop. The German pitting as Alessi was leaving. He would rejoin fourth. Lap 40, Hill was now right with Alessi and about to lap Tarquini. It seemed that the Englishman had blown it. Berger was in for his second stop on the same lap but wouldn't return. Gearbox to blame. For Hill, the new nose would cost him dear, dropping back to fourth. With 15 laps to go, Schumacher pitted for the third and last time. He rejoined second. Lacey still in front by 22 seconds. 20 seconds further back, Hill was closing on Coulthard in third. Schumacher was gaining on Alessi at a rate of two seconds per lap. Hill was just three behind Coulthard. Lap 59. It probably didn't cost him the championship, but it's certainly when he lost it. With six laps to go, Alessi ran wide at the chicane, which ironically Schumacher had helped design. Cost five seconds. Carried by the patriotic crowd, Schumacher had closed to within striking distance by lap 65. Three to go and more back markers. On seriously worn tyres, Alessi tried everything to hang on to the lead. But Schumacher is ruthless, and coming into the chicane, he made his move, forcing Alessi over the curves. He was through. A replay shows just how close they both were to coming off. Wheels interlocked, they had touched. The German's 17th Grand Prix victory, and probably his greatest so far. The second consecutive title virtually in the bag. Damon Hill wouldn't argue with that. At the flag, Alessi had fallen away by more than two seconds. David Coulthard had hung on to third, and a lap down, Barrichello, Herbert and Irvine rounded off the top six. So the European Formula One season ended on a high. The world champion was not yet crowned, but only a miracle could prevent Schumacher from winning. With three races left, he only needed a fourth place to retain his title. Schumacher's words after the race were those of someone who knew he'd won the championship. After my second stop, I thought that's it. Now I uh, saw the situation, I thought I had a good chance now to win. But then they told me I have to come in another time. I thought, what's this? I didn't expect this and uh, I thought the race is over but then it, it obviously it worked out I have to say that the guys have uh, the whole year done a fantastic job in all this area pit stop strategies giving me always a car which uh, I was able in the end of the day to win even it was difficult at uh, when we started sessions Friday and Saturday but up to Sunday we always were there and I thought as well that being able to win in Hockenheim, uh, I used up my luck. But uh, I didn't use up all of this. I was able to win here in front of a home crowd, which was unbelievable. When I saw Damon gone off, uh, I thought either to stay in second position, drive uh, home six points, or go in and fight for the first place, which was quite far away at this p uh, moment. But then when I saw all this support and uh, the fans, I thought I must win. I must do everything to win this race. So I did. It worked out. But I have to say uh, a big reason and a big thanks to my supporters. Uh, they have been here under difficult circumstances. I mean, weather and everything. It's fantastic to see I have uh, such fantastic supporters. For Hill, it was a day of ifs and buts. But he was the one who had to go for it and fail. And he was the first to congratulate the victor. Jan Magnussen takes over from Mika Hakkinen, who's recovering from appendicitis. Aguri Suzuki is back in the Ligier. Katayama, fit and well again, is back in his Tyrrell. 
Morbidelli gets his footwork seat back and Bertrand Gachot returns to the Pacific team for the Pacific Grand Prix where once again David Coulthard kept up his superb form with his fourth consecutive pole position two tenths ahead of Damon Hill who shaded Schumacher by a mere 800 the young Scott did it again while Hill in his efforts not to let Schumacher through runs wide the two Ferraris sneaking past on the other side before he recovers to limit the damage to just a Lacey It's all good news for Coulthard, able to pull a comfortable gap in less than a lap. The Lacey slowing Hill and Berger holding Schumacher. Lap five, Schumacher comfortably outdrags Berger to take fourth before the hairpin. Three laps later, he's with Hill and immediately launches an attack on third place. Lap 11, it's an ignominious end to Suzuki's return to the Ligier seat. Rubens Barrichello was having difficulty with new boy Jan Magnussen. The fight for 10th place would last 20 laps. Hill and Schumacher still caught up behind a Lacey, who is proving just quick enough to stay ahead. Coulthard is able to stretch his lead to 14 seconds and still pulling away at about a second a lap. Lap 18, a Lacey, Hill and Schumacher all choose to make their first scheduled fuel tar stops. Schumacher gets out first. Alacy is close behind. Hill is left trailing as Schumacher narrowly avoids Irvine's Jordan. The German is now fourth, Alacy sixth, and Hill ninth. Four laps later, Magnussen heads into the pit lane for his first ever fuel and tyre stop. No problem at all. With the first round of stops complete, Schumacher is up to second and chasing the leader, Coulthard. Irvine is third, Alesi fourth, and Hill displaces Frensen for fifth. Next lap, same corner, Alesi pushes past Irvine to take third. Hill follows, but it doesn't come off. Much worse, the front wing is damaged. In the replay, the way through is clear, but either Irvine doesn't see Hill, or he deliberately chops in front. Lap 24, Coulthard is in for his first stop, and it becomes apparent that he's running just a two-stop strategy. Irvine having also headed for the pits, Hill could look once again for a way past De Lacy. Lap 37, Schumacher is in for stop number two, holding on to second place. As Coulthard comes up to lap the Barrichello Magnussen battle, still locked together after both have stopped. Unable to find a way past De Lacy, Hill makes his second stop on lap 38. Patrick Head checking the damage to the front wing. Schumacher is relentless in his pursuit of Coulthard. The Scotsman stopping on lap 49 for the second and last time, handing Schumacher the lead. But Schumacher still had his third and final stop to make, with a margin of 20 seconds. The stop came on lap 60.
As Coulthard rounded the final turn onto the start-finish straight, the Benetton was already on its way. Schumacher had the lead and the fresher tyres. Coulthard would have to settle for second. Victory was secure both in the race and the championship. After a long, hard season, the Benetton crew could finally celebrate. With 15 seconds the gap at the finish, Schumacher had won the championship his way, emphatically and with a win. It brings the champion's total to 18 wins from 67 starts, better than a 1 in 4 ratio. With Coulthard taking second, Hill finished third, Berger fourth, Alessi fifth and Herbert sixth. The Pacific Grand Prix claimed only seven cars, including both footworks and, ironically, both the Pacifics. But the day belonged to Schumacher, the youngest ever double champion. But the Constructors' Championship wasn't over yet. Um, I will say here and now that uh, I congratulate Michael on his second world championship and it's been a very tough fight this year but I am truly um, respectful of his ability as a driver. He's shown on numerous occasions that he has extraordinary talent and speed and um, Thank you. congratulations to him for his second world championship. The way the team has, has uh, come up with strategies and used the strategies and done it, I mean, it's, uh, I know I've seen something like this, <laughs> and I've really to, to say I have a f***ing good uh, crew who, who does this job. It's unbelievable for me, not one mistake this season really, and uh, just really, really good these guys. The champion hasn't only been soaked in champagne this season. With only three completely dry weekends in the 1995 season, it became increasingly important to perform well in the wet or mixed conditions. So amongst the current generation of drivers, who is the rainmaster in the mould of Jackie X, Pedro Rodriguez or Ayrton Senna? The answer seems to be Jean Alesi. Give the Frenchman a handful of a car, which his Ferrari often is, and in the wet, he'll transform it. Only Michael Schumacher seems to be in the same league. Carl Wendlinger gets another chance at Sauber in preference to Jean-Christophe Bouillon and Mika Hakkinen, minus his appendix, returns to McLaren for the penultimate round of the championship, the Japanese Grand Prix at Suzuka. Coulthard wasn't on pole this time, he was languishing down in sixth, more than a second slower than fastest man Schumacher. Alesi shared the front row and crept forward before the green. When the lights did change, the champion was first away on the wet track with Alesi, Hakkinen, Hill and Coulthard emerging from the spray behind. Into turn two, Irvine came around the outside of the Scots and was passed. Lap four, Schumacher led and second place to Lacey was awarded ten seconds for his jump start. Berger, down in seventh, was also guilty. Lap five and Lacey was in for his penalty. Second place was gone. Hakkinen was now second, Hill third, right behind the McLaren. 
Last seven, Alacy was back in the pits. He needed to gamble and did, switching to Slick. It dropped him back to 15th, but Alacy was on a charge. Out of the chicane, he was all over Lamy's Minardi and went to pass the Portuguese on the outside. A full 360, and he was back on his way. At the end of lap 10, Schumacher was in for Slicks. Lacey was a full seven seconds a lap faster and already up to fifth, before taking second from Hills-Williams under breaking for the chicane. Lap 16, Barrichello loses the rear end of his Jordan. In replay, he was lucky not to take out teammate Irvine. Lap 17, Berger out with engine problems. Lap 25, with Schumacher not far in front, and Lacey runs out of luck. Smoke pouring from the tail of the Ferrari. After such a brilliant display, Lacey was now out. A drive shaft bearing had failed. Lap 31, Schumacher was in for his second stop. Hill assuming the lead. Both were charging, but Schumacher harder. Lap 35 and Hill was in. A quicker stop than Schumacher's, but still giving the German a 13-second lead. Lap 37. Hill was offered the spoon curb. The Williams indulging in a little rally cross and managing to continue. But he would have to come in for a new nose. Lap 40. Same corner, second Williams. Like Hill before, Coulthard would keep it going. But only so far as the next corner. Mud and stones flying from the side pods and tipping the Scots straight off. Just moments later, Hill was off at Spoon Curve again, this time for good. Not a good day for Williams, the team totally bemused by what had happened. For Benetton, it was a celebration. They now couldn't be caught in the battle for the Constructors' Championship. Mika Hakkinen had stayed on and was now second, behind Schumacher a comfortable 20 seconds ahead. It was plain sailing for the German who took his ninth win of the season. In Aida, he'd taken the Drivers' Championship for himself. In Suzuka, he took the Constructors' Championship for his team. McLaren were jubilant with Hakkinen second, and Herbert rounded out Benetton's day with a solid third. Irvine's Jordan took fourth, Harnes Lugier fifth, and Salo's Tyrrell sixth. A jubilant Flavio Briatore had been handed his and Benetton's first constructor's win. Williams reeling back in second. Mika Hakkinen and McLaren Mercedes were back, having qualified third. Second in the race was no fluke. The champion was a happy man after the race. Team told me... Uh, to take it easy at certain stages because when Hill w went out in, uh, and it was finished, I radioed to the phone and congratulated them to the Constructor Championship because I knew once one car is out, then <laughs> they're going to be champion, whatever the situation will be at the end, because we had 11 points ahead on them. And I said, yeah, but take it easy, go for the race, go for the win. <laughs> so yeah, don't worry. So I did. For Damon, there was time to reflect. With both championships now over, the mood in Australia for the 17th and final round of 1995 was a lot more relaxed. It would be the last Grand Prix in Adelaide before Formula One's move to Melbourne. Then, on Friday afternoon, Mika Hakkinen suffered this horrific accident. Mika is expected to make a full recovery. Damon Hill had claimed his first pole since Hungary with Coulthard alongside and Schumacher right behind. 205,000 fans were there to watch. 
at the green. Both Williams got a flyer this time. Coulthard matching Hill all the way before slipping by into turn one. With the Ferraris third and fourth, Schumacher was back in fifth, just ahead of Frenson. Keen to get back past the Lacey as quickly as possible, Schumacher attacked at the first opportunity, the hairpin. Fourth, next target, Berger. With Coulthard and Hill pulling clear at the front, it wasn't until the hairpin again on lap five that Schumacher could effectively challenge. Third. Taki Inui didn't get in the way for long, the Japanese ending the season in a not unfamiliar fashion. The second Benetton of Johnny Herbert was attacking. Frentzen the target. The hairpin at the end of the straight, the place. The move unsuccessful. Hill is in first, having just set fastest lap. He loses just one place. To Schumacher. Lap 20, Coulthard is in when, unbelievably, he slides into the wall on the entrance to the pit lane. On the replay, you can just see a line of oil beneath the right-hand side of the Williams. The leader was out in the most absurd of circumstances. Lap 22, Schumacher stopped and rejoined behind a Lacey again. Hill was thus in the lead and pulling away comfortably. From a Lacey second, Schumacher back in third. Lap 23, Schumacher was sizing a Lacey for a carbon copy of his manoeuvre into the hairpin on lap one, but a Lacey wasn't having it this time. With bits of Ferrari flying, a Lacey headed straight for the pits with caution. Roberto Moreno's last race for 40 had ended a lap earlier. Same situation, different execution to Coulthard's version. Lap 24, Schumacher was in. The incident with a Lacey having done more harm than first realized. For a Lacey, though, it was over. One lap later, the German was back in the pits and out of the race. Benetton hopes now rested with Herbert, but he too had difficulty with the pit entrance. For Hill, no such worries, and a 50-second lead over Berger, who now found himself second. At least until lap 35, when the Ferrari expired. Now Frenson was second and Herbert third with seventh place Blundell about to be lapped. Neither Frenson nor Sauber were much amused. Behind Harold it would soon be over. Lap 40 and retirement with a broken gearbox. Irvine was now third, but Blundell still needed to be lapped. Half distance, and with a lead of nearly a lap over second-placed Herbert, Hill made his second scheduled stop. There were problems, but he was safe. Lap 61, the end of the road for Irvine. A recurring pneumatic valve problem with the Peugeot V10. Now Parnis took over the dreaded third place in the Ligier, but it wouldn't last as Herbert ahead slowed and retired. Barnes had crept into second and relative safety. For Johnny, gone was a potential third place in the championship. The footwork of Morbidelli was now up to third, and Tyrrell were worried about Katayama's Yamaha, and rightly so. An oil line failure signals the end for the Japanese. With five laps to go, Parnis was in trouble. The Mugen billowing smoke. The odds touch and go. Minardi was sweating too. Lamy sixth. 
With just the last few corners to go, Hill became Ligier's saviour. Lapping Parnis for the second time, it meant the Frenchman had one less lap to endure. Damon thus crossed the line, the winner. Nearly five miles ahead of Parnis in second and ending the season on a high. For Ligier, it was their best result of the year. For Morbidelli in third, his best ever. Blundell soldiered on to fourth, Sarlo made it to fifth, and Lamy gave Minardi its first point of the season. With only eight cars finishing, it was a gruelling event, but a happy end to an exciting season. We had uh, uh, one moment, of course, with Mika, and uh, best wishes to Mika and a full recovery for him and a uh, speedy recovery. Um, uh, but uh, that was, you know, other than that, it, it, was, uh, it was a good weekend. There was a terrible uh, smell and oil in my car because it was the oil of uh, uh, Olivier. And for all the races, I said, oh, well, here is this smell. Well, come, come on, engine, come on, come on. I did my last, uh, my last uh, 20 laps and they said, come on, another one, another one. But the smell was, was uh, from, from, from him. So this was my problem, really. But uh, the, really, for me, no. No, I try to, to be serious because it's important for me. It's the first time that I'm, I'm finishing podium. Gerhard dropped out, and Michael dropped out, and uh, David dropped out, and Herbert dropped out. It was ridiculous. So, you know, it was a country famous for flies. They were dropping like them here. I went to, uh, I was uh, surfing in, in Perth before I came here, and uh, in the surf shop, the guy running the surf shop taught me a new phrase, which was too easy, mate. And uh, I think you could uh, probably apply that to this one.